so tonight we're simply going to be dealing with what we bring to prayer. Um, now, last week we talked about the necessity of tethering our prayer life to Scripture. And so the things that we're going to be talking about tonight are not things that uh, we just simply think are good ideas. Everything that I'm going to be addressing tonight are things that the Bible tells us we're supposed to bring when we come to prayer. And I, I hope that none of what I say is new to any of you. Um, I don't think that I've got anything on this page that in on my notes tonight that you're going to sit there and go, wow, never heard that before. The truth is, is that most of the things that we're going to, to talk about and hear about prayer are not things that um, you don't already know. But they're things that we need to let settle and sink into us more. They're things that we need to really believe and, and, and live out. And the things that I'm going to share tonight, I could have picked a number of things to share as to what we're supposed to bring when it comes to prayer, when it comes to craving intimacy with the Lord. What is it that we're supposed to bring? I've chosen four, and I chose these four in particularly because these are things that the Lord has really been showing me lately. These are things, so I, and I thought the best way to, to teach tonight would probably be to share the things from my heart that the Lord has really been showing me. And so these four tonight are things that we are to bring. These are things the Lord has really been showing me, and I hope they'll be a challenge to you and a blessing to you. The first thing that we're supposed to bring, the first thing that, that the Bible speaks about when it comes to what we're supposed to bring is joyful fear. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 145. Just know that any of the texts that I'm going to be reading tonight is just one of many texts that I could have chosen from. Um, none of the things I'm going to be sharing are simply found in one verse of Scripture. They're found in multiple verses of Scripture. I've chosen one or two each time. Psalm 145, verses 18 and 19. The Lord is near to all who call on Him. To all who call on Him in truth. That's important. Did we not talk last week about the necessity of our prayers being proper um, and about us knowing the truth of who God is and how we're supposed to pray? God is near to those who call upon Him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear Him. He also hears their cries and saves them. John Calvin says the first thing that we must bring to prayer is a sense of seriousness and magnitude of what prayer is. The Bible calls it fearing the Lord. Fearing the Lord. Now what do we mean when we speak about Fearing the Lord. Now, I hope when you hear those words, you don't think being scared of God. I, I hope that you don't go, oh, I'm supposed to fear the Lord. I, I'm scared of the Lord or I'm afraid of the Lord. So the question is, if we don't mean dread or we don't mean to be afraid of, then what do we mean when we when we speak about being um, having fear of the Lord? R.C. Sproul says the fear of God that springs from faith, that is key. This proper fear springs from faith. Now, the other kind of fear and dread, does, that, that does not spring from faith, does it? In fact, the Bible says that, that perfect love does what to that kind of fear? It casts it out. So we're not talking about a kind of fear of dread. We're talking about a fear that comes from faith. He said the fear of God that springs from faith is a special response to revelation. When we read in Scripture who God is, the greatness of God, the might of God, the power of God, the love of God, when we simply understand how God has revealed Himself and who He's revealed Himself to be, a response, a proper response from that is a faith response in fearing the Lord. So this fear comes from faith. Tim Keller gives a wonderful, wonderful illustration. Let's say that you got a chance to meet one of your heroes. 
I mean, one of the people that you look up to the most in the world, it may be some kind of celebrity, some sports star, some theologian. Uh, you know, it, think about the person. If you could pick one person to meet, who would it be? And that person were to walk through the door tonight. Dirk. Dirk, yeah, that would be one that I would think of. <laughs> if he were to walk through the door tonight, or she were to walk through the door tonight, and were to walk directly up to you, and put out their hand and say, hi, my name's so-and-so, it's nice to meet you. Now in that moment, probably what's gonna happen is your palms are gonna get sweaty immediately. You're gonna get nervous. You're gonna get short of breath. And there's gonna be a sense in which fear kind of rises up in you. Now it's not fear that you're gonna get punished. It's not a fear that like you need to run away because you're scared to death of this person. There is a kind of joy that will overtake you, the fact that this person that you look up to so much, you're now getting a chance to interact with this person and encounter this person, that joy is gonna result in some natural fear coming. Why? Because you don't wanna mess this up. You don't wanna say something stupid. You don't wanna act dumb. You wanna act proper and in front of this person that you admire so much. I think about the fact that if I, you know, people always ask these questions, you know, Four people in history, if you could sit around a table and have a conversation with four people in history, who would it be? I don't know if a conversation would take place. Not with me and them. I mean, they may talk to one another, but I would be sitting there scared to death to say anything because I'm thinking, I'm going to say something stupid. If you know, I, I would always love to think that me and C.S. Lewis could sit down and have a talk, but he would probably just, you know, critique everything I'm saying. And by the time I'm done, I'm walking away and I'm like, oh, that was pointless. I just said a whole bunch of dumb stuff. The reason why that fear comes is because there's a kind of joy that comes with it. You're, you're excited and you're in awe that you get to meet this person, but then that causes you to have a, a sense of fear that you don't want to mess things up or say the wrong thing. You're right, brother, when you talk about it being respect. It's kind of a joyful admiration. <laughs> And a respect comes out of that. And because you respect this person, you don't want to mess up the encounter. Speaking of C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite lines in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. If you've never read that book, you think, oh, that's a kid's book. Um, you are not doing yourself justice. Pick up a, a, a copy of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and read it. Um, one of my favorite lines is when the children have met Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. And they're in Mr. and Mrs. Beaver's house and they're sitting around and Mrs. Beaver is uh, frantically cooking and getting everything ready. And they start having this conversation about who these children are and that they're sons and, and daughters of, of Adam and Eve. And uh, there's a prophecy that said when um, two sons of daughters and two, uh, I mean, when two sons of Adam and daughters of Eve sit on uh, Care, Parabell and Throne, winter will meet its death um, and Aslan will, will reign. And... Um, the kids are sitting there and they're, they're pondering and, and uh, C.S. Lewis writes that when they hear the name Aslan, a, a warmth comes over all of them. And they say, Aslan, who's Aslan? And Mr. and Mrs. Beaver are kind of taken off guard. They're like, you're kidding. You've never heard of Aslan. And they're like, no, who is Aslan? And they said, Aslan is, he's the king of beasts. He's a lion. And Susan makes this remarkable statement. She says, a lion? Well, I, I would be afraid to meet a lion. Are you sure he's safe? And Mr. Mr. Beaver says, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And there is a sense in which that's the way we're to, we're to approach God. We, we want to be in the presence of God. We want to encounter God. But there's got to be a part of us that is so overjoyed by the fact that we, have a con we can have a conversation and an encounter with God that we better do this thing properly. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was a teenager, I was a junior, and uh, we went to a camp in Glorieta, New Mexico. And one of the reasons why we do our own camps around here is because we have um, had too many encounters with people preaching and us having to go, what? Um, so we just do our own teaching and preaching now. And uh, we, we went, and I remember we were in Gloria, Gloria, New Mexico, and a bunch of college students that kind of helped run the camp. And um, right before the message, 
uh, one of the college students comes up to pray for us before um, it starts. Now, you got to remember, I'm 17 years old, and even I knew this wasn't right. So he gets up there. He walks up. He goes, will you pray with me? What's up, God? You know, it's been a crazy day. And he starts talking. And then when he gets done talking, he says, all right, talk to you later. And he walks off stage. And I remember even as a 17-year-old going, something about that is not right. Something about that. And, and I get what he was trying to do. He was trying to teach teenagers just to converse with God. But here's the problem. I say this about my wife all the time. My wife is my best friend, but she is not my buddy. You know what I mean? Yep. I can tease with my buddies and I can joke with my buddies a way that I better not joke with her. I'll joke with my buddy and we'll be like, ah, ha, 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 and I joke with her and she goes, what? <laughs> Why? Because there is there is a reverence that I have for my wife. She is my best friend. She's not my buddy. Remember those shirts that used to go around, Jesus is my homeboy? <laughs> what a bunch of nonsense that is. Yeah, yeah. Jesus is my best friend. He's not my homeboy. Yeah. And I remember, I remember thinking too about John. John was the beloved disciple. But I have a hard time believing that John talked to Jesus and Peter the same way. He talked to Peter one way. He talked to Jesus another way. Now, that didn't disconnect their relationship. That didn't mean they weren't close. It just means there was a proper respect for Jesus. And that's what we're talking about here. Calvin says that this sense of awe or this joyful fear is to be a crucial part of prayer. Prayer requires it. The very fact that we can access the attention and presence of Almighty God should concentrate the thoughts and elevate the heart. This means that we should not approach God in distant formality. We don't approach God in distant formality, nor do we approach Him in casual familiarity. Before we move on, I want to say that this involves the affections of the heart. Our affections must be stirred. I think one of the reasons why our prayer lives are so weak and frail and, and void of power is that we do not pray long enough for our affections to be stirred. Our our affections, our emotions should be moved. I can promise you one thing. I can guarantee you this. If the moment you see Jesus face to face, your affections will be moved. That will not be an emotionless interaction between you and Jesus. It will be full of emotion. Then why do our prayer lives so often lack any emotion? There's times where I'm, and, and shame on me that they're not more often. There's times where I'm walking and praying and I laugh. I, I, I get overcome with just the blessings of God and I laugh and I'm just like, what a great God. The fact that, that you would, you know, y'all you ever wake up and the moon and the sun are up at the same time? Yeah. You, we should just stop and go, wow, what an, an amazing God that you are. What an amazing God. You did it again. The sun came up and the moon's still out. I don't even know how that can work, but, you know, <laughs> praise you, God. Matthew 15, 8, Jesus said, These people honor me with their lips. Then what does he say? But their hearts are far from me. So it's possible for you to pray all the right things, to say all the right words. But if the affections are not stirred, if you're not moved, then what are we doing? Amen. The Westminster Larger Catechism, mainly a Presbyterian uh, which, by the way, other than infant baptism and the way they kind of set up their or organization of the church, as far as doctrines go, us and the Presbyterians, we're pretty close cousins. <laughs> and the Westminster Larger Catechism says that prayer should, listen to this, should engage the affections with due apprehension of God's power, majesty, and grace. But our affections should be moved. 
And when are they moved? So, and this is the point. They're moved when we come to the all. Why am, why, if Dirk walked through that room, would all of a sudden I get afraid? Because I would be so excited at the fact that I get to meet Dirk. I don't want to say something stupid. I don't want to walk up to him and go, Guten Tag, you know, and say something <laughs> weird in German. And he looks at me like, who is this idiot? Right? I don't want to, I don't want to be, because I'm so excited and joyful that I want to do it right. I want to approach this person properly. And that is, is how our heart ought to come and approach God. We should be so excited that we, have a, we can have a conversation and an encounter with Almighty God that there should be a reverence and an awe that is filled with joy in that moment. Second is humility. Turn to Luke chapter 18. And while you're flipping there, you know God is going to make you in awe of Him, right? In one way or another, God is going to get you to be in awe of Him. He will put you wherever He needs to put you. He will do with you whatever He needs to do with you. He, he will bring events about to make sure that you have a joyful fear of Him if you belong to Him. He's not going to sit by and allow his children not to have a joyful fear. And praise the Lord for it. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other men extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. The Pharisee is given over to self-conceit, wrapped up in himself, seeing only his self-righteous deeds, and he lays out his virtues to the Lord, despising all those that he thinks are underneath him. He exalts himself, he praises himself, and he goes away unjustified. No person can be justified in the presence of God by bringing up their own virtuous deeds. The very opposite will occur. But the tax collector sees no good in himself. And far from taking any credit for anything good, he does not even lift his eyes to heaven. But he cries out, Be merciful to me, a sinner. E. M. Bounds says this, Prayer has no beginning, no ending, and no being without humility. Ian Bound says there is no such thing as prayer if you're not humble. It's not prayer. It's something else, but it's not prayer. Calvin describes humility as a strong dependence upon God, upon God in general and a readiness to recognize and repent of our own faults in particular. So in general, what humility is, is it's total dependence upon God. And in particular, then, it's confessing our own weaknesses before God. Calvin also warns against the common medieval and modern view, and it is medieval and modern. It was medieval, and now we've allowed it to move and morph into our thinking today. The view that prayer was a way of putting on your best spiritual clothes. So we're going to come to God and we're going we're gonna to stand, and in a sense, we're going to wrap ourselves up in, in the best that we got, and we're going to stand before God, and we're going to impress Him with how devout we are. <laughs> Calvin rejected this idea, and he said that God could not be appeased by devotion, or that He would hear prayers for the sake of mere performance. God doesn't hear prayers on the basis of your performance. Can you imagine? If he did? When would he hear us? 
When would he when would he draw close to us if it was based on the way we perform? In fact, people who pray properly come with the exact opposite attitude. When you come in prayer to God, it's about opening up and being real and being honest. He knows it anyway. You cannot hide it from Him. We have to be honest about our flaws, honest about our weaknesses. We don't have to put on our best face when we come to pray. We should come to God knowing that He is our only hope and we have no hope if it's not in Him. And we must be honest about our doubts and our fears and our emptiness. This is about being broken before God. Real prayer, if prayer is to mean anything, it is us coming before God and being like and being honest and saying, God, I am nothing. I am broken. I am empty. I Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I'm afraid. I'm fearful. I'm sinful. Here's who I am. And so I am throwing myself down at your feet in this conversation. And I know that I don't stand here in front of you and in this conversation, in this encounter, in my own righteousness. I know that I don't come boldly before the throne of grace because of me, but because of Jesus. For I am nothing. Be merciful to me, O oh God, a sinner. Remember when Isaiah saw the glory of God in Isaiah chapter uh, 6? Yeah, in Isaiah 6. Remember what happens? The, the train of God's glory fills the temple and this cloud of glory comes and, and he hears holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. By the way, that is a pre-incarnate Jesus that he sees. We know that from the book of John. And what does Isaiah say when he sees the glory of God? Woe to me, for I am a man of unclean lips. I live in a land of, of people with unclean lips. Man, that will that, always be our attitude when we come to God. Seeing him for who he is puts us in proper perspective. We'll talk more about this self-knowledge next week, but for now we'll leave it. Now this is far from what the modern man wants to hear, isn't it? We want to hide our shortcomings and hide our failures. That's why we come to... You, by the way, we do it with one another too. We come to church and we put our best face on and we avoid letting anyone see our shortcomings because we think we're not going to be loved. We're not going to be received. But the truth is a church that is expressing the grace of God will be a church where people can be real and honest. Amen. Because what will happen is, is I have a, a, a confidence that if, if I, as I express my fear, my doubt, my weakness, my brokenness, and my emptiness, I am going to be expressing that to a bunch of other people who realize that they're broken and empty and they need the grace of God too. Yep. Yep. So I don't think we're going to, I would love to think that we don't do it to each other, but we do it with God. I don't think we do it to God either. I think we put on our best face and we go to pray and we, and we want to pretend to God that everything's fine yep. because that's what the natural man wants to do. That's not how prayer can be done. Tim Keller says, prayer both requires and empowers the abandonment of self-justification, self -justification, blame shifting, self-pity, and spiritual pride. Here's what's amazing. The natural man, ask yourself this question. Why does the flesh resist humility? Why would the flesh, why would the devil not want you to be real and honest and humble before God? Because there's freedom in it. Yes. That's why. Yes. There, it, listen, self-righteousness binds you up. It just wraps you up. There, there's no freedom in self-righteousness. It is a constant endeavor of you trying to shove everybody else down. You can't live free. You're always having to walk a certain way, and you got to make sure you're doing everything right, and then you got to judge everybody else and push them down so you can make yourself feel better. There is freedom in humility. I've said this often to the kids upstairs. You're never going to be able to call me a hypocrite because I'm telling you right now, I'm an idiot. I'm never going to be preaching something to you that, I, that I've got a grasp on completely or that I do. I am preaching to myself before I ever preach to you. Mm -hmm. 
I'm just as messed up as anybody here. And there's freedom in that. And by the way, that is the gospel. I'm broken. I'm undone. And it's all about you. And that, there's freedom in that. Ian Bounds Ian Bound says that's the fertile ground of prayer. You want your prayers to mean something. The fertile ground of prayer is humility. Three, balance interaction. Now, if we start reading through the prayers of the Bible, if we read in the Psalms and we read all the prayers, one thing's going to jump out at us pretty quickly is that there are all different forms of prayer. There's all different aspects and, and things mentioned in prayer, all kinds of dimensions to prayer. We have praise and adoration. We have confession. We have thanksgiving. We have petition. We have supplication. Um, I, when I pray, I try to think about the word acts. Um, it may be juvenile, but it works for me. So what does that say? Maybe I'm juvenile. <laughs> but that, it helps me. Adoration. Confession. Thanksgiving. Supplication. Adoration. Praise. I mean, all i got to do is flip through the Psalms. How many times do we have David just praising the Lord? But we also have confession, don't we? We also have thanksgiving. We also have supplication. What is supplication? That's making our petitions, casting our cares upon the Lord, praying for other people, intercession for others, praying for our needs. We see all of these in the Bible. So the question is, which form of prayer should be preferred over another when we go to God? There have been books written that try to answer this question. Which aspect of prayer ought to be the way that we pray? I just want to say the question and the books are pointless. Yeah. Don't waste your time reading a book that tells you, that tries to focus on what kind of prayer you should have. We should not prefer any one type over another. We should not think as one is a lower stage of prayer and we're kind of ramping ourselves up to the highest form of prayer. In fact, each of them is necessary to the others. They interact with each other. Let, let me demonstrate this. So acts, right? Take acts. Adoration is first. You go to the Lord. The very first thing you start doing is you start praising God. You're praising God for who he is. You're praising God for what he does. You're glorifying his attributes. Thank you that you are a sovereign God. You are a mighty God. But thank you, Lord, that, that you hold all things together by the word of your power. Thank you, God, that you're a loving God. And as you start meditating and you start thinking about what the Bible says about who God is, all this praise is just going to burst forth. But do you know what's going to happen when you think about God? You're going to start thinking about yourself in light of God. What did we see today? In Revelation chapter 4 in Sunday school. Holy, holy, holy. And then I think of me and I think unholy, unholy, unholy. And I'm not talking about my position with God. I'm talking about how I live and who I am and, and what, what I do. And I think, man, I'm, I'm nowhere close to who God is. So guess what that, guess what we start doing then? All of a sudden we get humble. Mm -hmm. And we got to start confessing. Lord, you know what? I haven't lately. I haven't been reading your word like I should. I have been loving people like I should. And all of a sudden, in the light of God's glory, and in light of adoration, we begin to confess our weaknesses and our brokenness. We begin to confess our sin. We begin to repent of things. But when you start thinking about a holy God who that you can encounter and that loves you and accepts you in spite of all of the things that you've got to repent from every day. And Martin Luther said repentance is just the breath of being a Christian. Yeah. It's just we breathe it in, breathe it out, breathe it in, breathe it out. We're always repenting of something. Yeah. Because, listen, I'm not the only idiot in the room, let's be honest. <laughs> I'm not calling you an idiot, but somewhere in the Bible I think it does. Um, <laughs> thank you, see, we got other people admitting that we're all idiots. Good. We, <laughs> what happens then? Then we can't help but be thankful. Thank you, Lord, that, that, that in spite of, of your complete otherness and, and my being totally separate from your character, that you sent Jesus so that you and I can have a relationship with one another. Thank you, Lord, for, for what you've done in my life. And all of a sudden now thanksgiving begins to burst out of you. Well, my goodness, when, when I start thinking about who God is 
and who I am and, and how thankful I am that, that God has a relationship with me and he's blessed me with all these things, why in the world would I not bring my needs to him? Who else would I take him to? So now supplication. Do you see how they interact with one another? That's why you can't start separating them out and be like, well, you better not talk about your needs too much. Well, no, you should talk about your needs. But the way that you start talking about your needs is in light of praise and thanksgiving and confession and adoration. And of course we're going to bring our needs to him. When we comprehend the greatness of God, it leads to a new grasp of our own sinfulness. Then a deeper recognition and recognition of sin leads to thankful wonder at God's grace. And the more we see God's power and his love, the more we'll want to depend on him for every one of our needs. These four different forms of prayer should all be used when we go to God, which will bring a balance to our prayer life and keep us from just focusing on one thing. And number four, I'll spend probably the most time on this. Restful trust and confident hope. Turn to Psalm 115 with me. Verse 2 and 3. Psalm 115, verse 2. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Pretty powerful statement. Pretty all-encompassing statement. God is in the heavens, and he does all that he pleases. Now turn to 1 Peter 5, 7. You're probably very familiar with this verse as well. 1 Peter 5, 7. <clears throat> Cast all of your anxieties or cares or fears on him because he cares for you. My entire Christian life, I heard this phrase. Prayer changes things. Question is, does it? If God does whatever he pleases, and Job is correct when he says, and we have every reason to believe he is, when he says, nothing can thwart your will, then does prayer really work? These two verses pose truths from Scripture about prayer. God is going to do as He pleases, and we are to cast our cares upon Him. They seem like they contradict. I'm supposed to take my prayers to the Lord and my requests to the Lord and ask God to do things knowing that God is only going to do what He pleases. Okay. Well, then how do I ever get God to do something? They seem to contradict. Now part of our issue is mystery. The mystery of the fact of God's nature. His nature is so far removed from us that we can't comprehend a whole bunch of stuff with God. Yeah. Right? But let me make something very clear. Just because something... Here's what I think we do too often. I think the Bible reveals things to us and we go, mystery. We just put up our hands. We go, mystery. It's probably not as mysterious as we think. We probably just haven't studied very much. We haven't thought about it very much. And so we just chalk it up to mystery. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to figure God out. It's not what I'm saying. But this is revelation. It reveals things to us. And part of our issue is that we have trouble grasping things. I do not believe these two statements, God does as he pleases and we're supposed to make our request to God, I do not believe they are contradictory in nature. Scripture does not teach nonsense. Does it? Things go together. 
God is sovereign, and we should both pray and make our requests. Both are true, and they are not nonsense. I've had people say this to me, oh, Neil, you're a Calvinist. You believe that God is in charge of every single thing that has ever existed. Nothing happens on the earth that God does not ordain. Well, then why do you pray? And I want to say, first of all, the Bible tells me to. There's answer number one. But I think we have, a, we have more than that from Scripture about why we pray. In fact, I am going to say the fact that God is sovereign is the reason why I should go to Him with my request. And let me demonstrate that. So let me give you a few things to think about in answering this question. If God is sovereign, He does all that He pleases, why should I pray? First, God invites us to pray and promises to answer our prayers. Let us not forget... This is what we do so often with prayers. Do you know what we... Let me ask you this question. What is the underlying thinking in the statement, if God is sovereign, then why pray? What's the underlying... What are, when people say that, what are the, what's the only aspect of prayer they're thinking about? Only petitions and requests. They've left out adoration. They've left out confession. They've left, left out thanksgiving. They're focusing. Do you see why you can't just focus on one? Yeah. It'll mess everything up. Yeah. Yeah. All they're doing is they're only thinking about making requests. Yeah. So basically their question should be, if God is sovereign, why make requests? Because yeah. yeah. it doesn't make any sense to say, well, why, if God is sovereign, why praise him? No one asks that. If God is sovereign, why confess? No one asks that. If God is sovereign, why have thanksgiving? Well, nobody asks that. They're talking about requests. Yeah. Yeah. Let us never forget that prayer is a conversation and an encounter. Why would I not go to God with everything? I get to go to Almighty God with everything? Why would I not go to Him? His sovereignty and His power and His control doesn't push me away. It draws me close. I serve a God that is all-powerful and does all that He pleases. Why would I not want to go to Him? So God is a loving Father. Prayer is a relationship. It's an encounter and a conversation. God also sometimes waits to give a blessing until we pray. Why would God do that? Why would God wait to give a blessing until we pray? John Calvin answers it this way. Maybe because... If, if we get something, if God gives us something before we pray for it, we might just chalk it up to ourselves. Mm -hmm. We might just say, well, the reason I have that is because of my diligence, mm -hmm. because of my skill, because of what I did. And sometimes God says, I'm going to move in your heart so that you pray for this thing so that when you get it, you'll know that I gave it to you. He says this thickens the illusion of self-sufficiency. We are not self-sufficient. So, first, God wants us to pray because it's a relationship. And second, God wants to give answers to prayers. He wants us to pray so that He can answer those prayers and we are dependent upon Him. And we realize that it's because of Him that we've gotten these things. Now, these two things I just mentioned go hand in hand and they complement one another. On one hand, we have not because we ask not. But on the other hand, what kind of Christian, listen to this, what kind of Christian, knowing the limits of their wisdom, would dare pray wanting God to give them everything they ask for? What Christian, knowing the limits of our own wisdom, would dare pray wanting God to give us everything that we ask for? I think we're fools if we go to God and we want everything we ask for. That is foolishness. We actually have great hope knowing that God will not give us anything that is against His will. Why, why is this restful trust and confidence hope? Because I can trust that God hears my prayers and I can rest in that and I have confident hope knowing God's never going to give me anything that goes against His will. Ever. He's not going to give me anything that goes against his will. 
So we can pray with confidence knowing God will give us always what is best for us. He may use our prayer to answer yes to our request. Or he may give us what is good for us by not giving us what we ask for. Illustration. My kid comes up to me. Says, Daddy, can I have this bar of chocolate? I really need it, Daddy. I didn't have any dessert, Daddy. Can I really have it? And I look at the clock. It's 10 o'clock in the evening. They think they need this, right? I mean, they'll even use the word need, and at times we'll have to go. No, there's a difference between need and want. Let's use those terms properly. I've kind of trained, trained them to get this way. Um, sometimes. And uh, so they'll, they'll come up to me, Daddy, what, Daddy, I, I really need this. Daddy, I'm so hungry. I need this, Daddy. Daddy, I need this, Daddy. Please give it to me. Come on, Dad. You know, there it goes. Now, they're asking for a chocolate bar at 10 o'clock at night, and they think they need it. But if they had the wisdom I had to know you don't need it, it's bad for you this late at night, not good for your teeth. If you knew what I knew, you wouldn't be asking for that. Yeah. But you're not as wise as I am when it comes to chocolate at 10 o'clock at night. So you think you need it. Tim Keller made this statement, and it is wonderful. God, When you pray to God, he will either give you what you asked for, or he will give you what you would have asked for if you knew what he knew. Yeah, amen. Think about that. God is either going to give you what you asked for, or he's going to give you what you would have asked for if you knew what he knew. Yeah. Thank God that when I come to him and I say, Lord, do this, do this, Lord, do this, Lord, that God goes, I can't. It's not what's best for you. And I'm going, but it is, I need this. And God goes, no, you don't. And if I had God's wisdom and perspective, I wouldn't be praying that anyway. And we can all testify. How many times has God put us through things in our lives that we were begging him to get us out of? And then once we're, we're through it all, we turn around and we say, I'm glad I went through that. Yep. Thank you, God, that you didn't take me out of that situation. Yep. Thank, me, God, thank you, God, that you put me. Why? Because now we have a different perspective, yep. don't we? Yep. My kid turns 20 and goes, you know what? I've got good teeth. I'm glad my parents didn't let me have chocolate every night at 10 o'clock at night. Now, sometimes I'll let him have fruit snacks when mommy doesn't know, but we're going we're gonna to delete, we're gonna delete that off the camera and that won't go online. So. As we've often said, prayer does not change God. Prayer changes us. It changes us. I've said this before in regards to um, evangelism. If God is going to save who God is going to save, why evangelize? First answer is because he tells us to. So call obedience. Second answer wows me. Because almighty God who could go to every single person just like he did Paul, knock them off the, on, onto the, the ground, shine a big bright light in their face and just directly speak to them. God could do that to everybody if he wanted to. Yeah. But the fact that God has chosen to use me mm -hmm. in bringing about the new creation blows my mind. Yeah. God basically says, you get to be an instrument for me. Why would I not want to be a part of that? Who says, oh, well, God's sovereign. I, won't, I don't want to be a part of evangelism. <laughs> How stupid. God's going, but I want you to be an instrument to bring about the new creation. Same thing with prayer. God could just give us everything without us praying. But the fact that our prayers become an instrument or a means by which he brings about something, why wouldn't we want to pray? We pray for somebody's healing and then God heals. I was an instrument. I was used, my prayer was used by God in this situation. Why would I not want to do that? And if God says no to the healing, we should still praise the Lord and say, well, he knows what's best. Remember Jesus the night he was dying? How did he pray? 
What, but what did, he, what did he pray before? Not my will, your will be done. Let this cup pass for me. Now, did he know the cup wasn't going to pass? Of course. But that contradicting or seeming contradicting didn't stop Jesus from making a request. He still made a request knowing ultimately I want your will, not my will. So we pray with restful trust and confident hope knowing that God is always answering prayers for our good. Let me say that again. We pray with restful trust and confident hope knowing that God is always answering prayers for our good. Amen. For our good. So, this is not all, but these are at least four of the things that we should bring when we come to prayer. Next week, we will look at what we receive from prayer. What are things that we get, not in the answers to prayer, but what are things that we get by praying?